In this video, we're going to discuss some foundational concepts from quantum mechanics that led to the quantum model of the atom, which is essentially the modern model of our understanding of what an atom looks like, and in particular, what electrons within the atom look like. And the quantum model is really an extension of Bohr's model in that it starts from Bohr's observations, Bohr's ideas, and provides deeper explanations of why the atom behaves the way it does. For example, with electrons appearing to occupy specific orbits and jumping between those orbits as photons are absorbed or emitted. And a key idea here and where we're gonna start is the idea of the de Broglie wavelength. And de Broglie's idea was, look, if light, which is classically wave-like, can have particle-like properties, then maybe matter, which is classically particle-like, can have wave-like properties. And how do we describe those wave-like properties of matter as a quantum phenomenon? One experiment that provided evidence that matter has wave-like properties was performed by Davison and Germer. And the basic setup is shown here. The idea is we take an electron beam and we essentially try to diffract it by passing that beam through a series of closely spaced slits. If the electrons were purely particles, then we would expect two lines of electrons where the two slits are located, or perhaps random dispersion of the electrons on our detector. But over time, what's observed is actually a wave-like pattern of electron positions on the detector, almost as if the electron is somehow diffracting, like the electron has wave-like behavior. To characterize the wave-like behavior of electrons and other very small particles, de Broglie proposed this idea of the de Broglie wavelength, which we represent using the symbol lambda because it is a wavelength after all, and so it has units of length and all that fun stuff. And so it's a, a wavelength in the same sense that the wavelength of light is, is a wavelength. And he proposed that that is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle, which is the product of its mass and its velocity. And we represent that momentum sometimes by itself, just with the letter P. So we can calculate the wavelength of a particle, the wavelength of any piece of matter using this equation. Let's get some familiarity with the de Broglie wavelength by calculating the wavelength of an electron with the parameters that you see on this slide. And to do this, we're gonna apply the equation that we just saw. The de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle, and we can express that momentum as a mass times a velocity of the particle. These parameters come right out of the problem. The mass and velocity are there, as we see. And we can simply plug those in with Planck's constant in the numerator. Here I have it listed in joule seconds and the mass in grams and the velocity in meters per second. If we expand out those joule units and think about unit cancellations here, this is going to give rise to length units overall in units of meters. And this comes out to 7.274 times 10 to the negative 11th meters or 72.7 picometers. Now, the wavelength here, the number, is not so important. What's interesting about this number is to think about it in terms of what the classical diameter of an electron particle is. Is this longer or shorter than what we think of as the diameter of an electron? And the answer is it's much longer. This is approaching an atomic radius, 72.7 picometers. This is a very long distance from the perspective of a classical electron. So the wave-like nature of the electron means it exerts its influence over a much larger volume or much larger area than would be predicted just based on a classical electron as a particle kind of model. And one thing to point out, which is mentioned in the readings in more detail, is the wave-like nature of the electron constrains how it can behave within the atom because the electron in some sense must act like a standing wave inside of the atom. And these wavelengths are on the order of wavelengths that would be needed to sort of make that work in a sense. And this provides a little bit of insight into Bohr's model, the idea that standing electron waves have to exist within the atom in order for the system to be consistent with basically the constraints of quantum mechanics. Now, three more key concepts from quantum mechanics that we need to understand the quantum model of electrons and atoms. The first is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and this is the idea that uncertainty in position, 
and momentum and other pairs of related experimental variables are sort of inversely related. So it's impossible for us, first of all, to exactly know the momentum and position of a particle, such as an electron within an atom. And as our precision in one increases, our uncertainty in the other also increases. In mathematical form, we can think about this as an inequality where the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty in position must be greater than or equal to a constant value, h bar divided by two, where h bar is just Planck's constant divided by two pi. This expresses a fundamental limitation in our knowledge about position and momentum of the electron within the atom, and it suggests the idea that if, for example, we know the energy and thus the momentum with great precision, we are not able to know the position with great precision. And so we're starting to think about the position in probabilistic terms. I can get a general idea of where the electron might be located, but not any precise information about where it is located if I know the energy exactly. That probabilistic understanding of where the electron might be located is encoded in mathematical form in what we call the wave function. It's the probability distribution of a quantum system like an electron inside an atom over space. And the wave function itself is a function of three spatial variables, x, y, and z. It may give a complex result, but the square of that, which must be a real number, is equal to the probability of finding the electron at that point. And this is the key feature of the wave function. So keeping this mathematical idea in mind, the wave function essentially is the probability distribution of, say, the electron in, within an atom over space. The wave function itself can have positive and negative values, and we'll explore that as we look at the shapes of wave functions for electrons within atoms. But the square of that, which is a real positive number, is equal to a probability. The probability of finding an electron at the point x, y, z. Wave functions come from a fundamental equation of quantum mechanics called the Schrodinger equation. This equation looks a little enigmatic if you've never seen it before. h bar times a wave function psi, and actually there are many solutions to this equation, so I've added an i subscript here, is equal to e times psi. So this h bar operator, which we call the Hamiltonian, we'll circle back to that in a second, perform some kind of mathematical operation on psi, and if psi, this wave function, is a solution of this equation, the result will be a constant value e times the original wave function. This is known as an eigenvalue equation, and it's solved using the strategies we use to solve eigenvalue equations, which you may be familiar with from linear algebra. To set up the Hamiltonian, which has to be a given, we need to understand the situation in the physical system. And for a simple atom like hydrogen, we have a positively charged nucleus, negatively charged electrons separated by some distance r. This gives us a sense of the energies within the system and how to express those mathematically. For example, the energy is going to be a combination of the kinetic energy of the electron due to its motion, that's represented by the letter T, and the potential energy associated with this separation between positive and negative charges. And that's represented with the letter V. And it depends on R, the distance between the electron and the nucleus. So with that in hand, that is our Hamiltonian operator. And of course, there are more specific expressions for T and V that we won't get into. But you will if you solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom in a physical chemistry class later in life. But this Hamiltonian is a given. It's sort of an input to the problem. Knowing that and having mathematical tools to solve this equation, the solutions that come out of the equation include two pieces. The E values, which are the energies allowed for electrons with these various wave functions, and the wave functions themselves, the psi values. The energies and wave functions taken together describe the stability in the, in the sense of the energy and the spatial positions in the sense of the wave functions of the electron. And they're collectively called orbitals. And there are, in theory, an infinite number of orbitals that an electron could access in the hydrogen atom, although the, the few that are the lowest in energy are going to be the most important since the electron will tend to occupy these and get as stable as it can possibly be. So what we're gonna do moving forward is survey the atomic orbitals of the hydrogen atom. And these provide a 
pretty solid foundation for understanding electrons in heavier atoms than hydrogen as well. So having a firm understanding of the atomic orbitals is important for thinking about electrons in heavy atoms and writing what are called electron configurations for heavy atoms. That's where we're going in the long run. We want to be able to essentially provide a map of sorts for the electrons within heavy atoms using these hydrogenic orbitals, orbitals that come from solving the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom as a foundation.